I just want to say thank you and, and behalf of Wayne Supply, say thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you all today. Uh, as he said, it was a little bit of a last minute thing, but uh, I've got a pretty good presentation I was able to get my hands on today. I think if, if everybody uh, keep a little bit of an open mind is what I suggest. As, as I was reading through this the last couple of days and going over it, uh, trying to think as myself, as as a guy out here trying to, to put up a quality, uh, a quality crop of hay, uh, just to keep an open mind and think about what can you do different maybe with the equipment you have, uh, what you can do in the future as you make future equipment purchases to streamline your oper operation and to try to work towards that uh, quality hay crop. So we'll move along here to the first. So we're talking about quality hay. So what is quality hay? We've got five things here. Uh, extent to which a forage has the potential to produce a desired animal response, high relative feed value and protein levels, high tonnage hay with maximum stand life, clean forage, void of weeds, molds, foliage, or foreign matter, bright green color and sweet smell, and easy to handle package. So we've got, we've got five different things here. Uh, all five of those things are something that can be relative to each one of you in your operation. Uh, and all five of those might be something you're after, or you might just be after one of them. But to get any of them, you have to put up a quality product. So looking at quality requirements based on livestock classes, uh, so depending on what we're doing, we, can, we might be changing our harvesting, our yield goals, uh, the quality that we're after, or the timing of which we're cutting our hay. Uh, so if you look, you know, we've got up here at the top, dairy first trimester, dairy calf. So based on what level of livestock we're feeding is going to produce what we need to produce. But no matter what, it needs to be a quality product. Uh, looking here at the importance, uh, the effects on livestock, we've got weight gain, milk production, reproductive efficiency. As you can see the first chart here, we've got a stalker beef calf uh, in Alabama. To get the highest average daily gain, we've got alfalfa, quality alfalfa. So as we go through that and we get down to the basis of it, just the hay sales, the better quality of, of hay we can put up, the more money we're going to put in our pocket. So the goal of harvesting should be to maintain the highest nutritive quality as possible. We're going to do this through cutting at the proper stage of maturity, promoting rapid dry down, maintaining high leaf content, and timely belling at the right moisture. So regardless of your end use, we're still, like I said, we're trying to put up the highest quality of product as we can. So we're going to look at the, the timing of, of cut. About 70% of the quality of hay is determined by stage of maturity at harvest. As a plant matures towards heading, flowering, and seed formation, the growth pattern changes from leaf production to hard stem formation. The digestible portion of the plant tissue decreases rapidly with each stage. Uh, what I'm thinking about this when I'm reading this slide, timing of cut. Being able to get in there, get everything cut down, and do it in a timely manner, and, and, and getting things done. So streamlining your equipment to the amount of hay you're going to be able to cut, the amount of time you have to be able to cut that hay down. Um, like we, we've talked about here, less mature. So we're, we're going for that young plant. We're going to have less yield but higher quality. Of course, if we go longer in that maturity stage, we're going to have more yield and less quality. So that goes back to what are we wanting to do with this hay? What is our end goal? So the timing of cut in the plant stage, harvesting at the bud stage allows producers to get more cuttings per year and keep increased production, improve the quality of their forages. So each day's delay in, in alfalfa harvest at the following impact. As we look at the top one, crude protein, percent dry matter, you're losing 0.25% of dry matter each day that you delay the harvest of that, of that crop. So it has have a lot of effect being able to get in the field and get this hay cut down and having the equipment needed to be able to do that. So mowing hay at the right time, daily changes in total non-structural carbohydrate of alfalfa. As we can see here in the chart, that plan is taken up sugars and starches as it goes throughout the day. Uh, the peak of that, as we see, is around 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and, and that's great. That shows you right when you need to cut that hay to have as much sugars and starches up into it. The problem with our area, the problem with Kentucky, is can we get that 
hay crop that's on the ground, if you go in there and cut at the peak time to 60% by nightfall. Uh, so you're, there's a give and take there. Uh, do we need to come in and start cutting at lunchtime and, and be okay with less sugars and less starches to be able to get that crop to 60% moisture by nightfall? We have to look at that, look at our equipment that we have and, and weigh those options. Uh, another one, that's, that's a time to take a look and look at your equipment line up and, and say, hey, do I need to be able to get in there, get this on the ground faster and get to that 60% moisture before nightfall? Uh, so, like I said, it's just it's all relation to sizing and what's going to fit with your operation to get that quality product. So, looking at uh, drying principles, so we're moving on from from cutting to what we need to do to get this crop dried down. Uh, why is dry down so important? Lower risk of storm damage. Trying to get that hay crop on the ground, get it dried down, and get it bailed up before the rain comes in. We just got talking about all the rain we're having, so it's fresh on everybody's mind. Uh, reduce the negative impacts of respiration, dry matter loss, sugar and starch consumption, total digestible nutrient loss, and relative feed value loss. Uh, so we're trying to reduce the impacts of respiration. So respiration, we're losing those starches and those sugars. So we're trying to get to 40% moisture to stop that respiration. So get this crop on the ground, get it to 60% before nightfall, because at nightfall we're going we're gonna to more quickly lose those sugars and starches, get it to that 40% and get it processed, get it up. And yield loss due to traffic damage after cutting. So we're trying to get in, get these plants, get it cut, get the crop on the ground, and get it up as fast as we can. Uh, I'll show here in a little in the slide, uh, as, that, as that stubble starts to mature into regrowth, we're gonna cause, we're gonna lose more yield the farther into that regrowth that we run over back over that stubble. So we want to be able to get in, get that crop back off, let that stubble be able to recover. So hay drying principles, if cutting a two ton acre crop must evaporate 8.5 tons to the acre of water before bailing. Just to give you an idea, that, that's how much water we're trying to retract out here. So by having the right equipment, by having the right uh, outline of what we're going to do, we can get that accomplished. So drying principles, like we were talking about respiration. Plant respiration is a chemical reaction by which plant cells stay alive through respiration. Plants use oxygen and produce carbon dioxide, thus result in the release of stored energies for use. So we're trying to get this crop to 40% as fast as we can, stop that respiration, keep that quality of that crop as high as we can. Uh, in other words, enzymes in the plant break down sugars. This process continues even after plant has been cut. So when we cut it, that, that, is still, that process is still going on. Like I said, that 40%, get to that 40%, stop that respiration. Since living cells continue to respire and use energy, hay should be managed to dry the forage to below 40% as rapidly as possible. Most plants are almost 80% water and continue to metabolize cellular carbohydrates and sugars until the moisture levels in the forage reach 40%. So like I said, trying to hit that 40% mark, trying to stop us losing those sugars and starches, keeping a relative feed value uh, as high as we can. So we're looking at drying principles and dry matter loss. Uh, a dry matter loss of 2% on hay value that's valued at $100 a ton on 10,000 tons, that's $20,000. Uh, as you can see, that increases as we go along there. So. Like we said, stopping that respiration, getting to that 40%, stopping the loss of that relative feed value, putting up that quality hay product. So quality loss due to respiration, if you got a relative feed value, forage grade premium, and you got a relative feed value of 173, if 4% dry matter, if starches and sugars is lost, just 4%, we're taking that relative feed value down to 158, bringing our grade down to good, we're losing $35 per ton just by that 4%. So trying to get your equipment and, and your game plan matched up, get this crop on the ground, and, and, and get it bailed up. Yield loss from traffic, like we talked about, uh, trying to get in, get this crop off, and, and not damage that the upcoming crop after. So 
yield loss to the next cutting is greater as the traffic occurs longer after mowing. The yield loss has generally been 4 to 6 percent per day after mowing. Uh, so as we see, traffic five days after mowing creates a yield loss of 22 percent other than two days were at around five. So those three days grow that potential of yield loss by a, a large amount. So looking at this, as we can see, stonewall openings, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, stonewall openings, um, that is something that's naturally in the plant. Uh, when you first cut that down, you first cut that plant down, those stomatal openings are going to stay open as long as they are getting sunlight. So you're going to lose that first 20% just from those stomatal openings, and that's going to happen pretty fast. Uh, the next thing that's going to be the most important is the conditioning of that crop as you've cut it. This is going to be the majority of your percentage of moisture you're going to try to lose in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and that crop needs that help from you and your equipment to make that happen. It's not going to do it on its own. So it needs that conditioning and the right type of conditioning to make that happen. Uh, so we've got, as you can see, that last little bit takes up a lot of time. But the stone roll opening, stone to open in daylight and close in darkness. Uh, a wide swath immediately after cutting is the single most important factor maximizing initial drying rate and preserving of starches and sugars. So we need to cut that crop, we need to get it spread out, we need to get the sunlight on it, leave those, let those stone roll openings stay open and take care of that first 15% of that, of that dry down. Uh, let, them, let them take care of that on its own. So we want to get that spread out. By doing that, you want to make sure you're selecting conditioning rollers that aren't bringing that crop in where you have a windrow that's arched up and you've got more material in the middle. You want to keep it spread out, keep the sunlight hitting that windrow. Uh, you also don't want conditioning rollers that when they do spread out, you get the larger amounts on the outside of the windrow, you're going to get the same effect. You're still going to have, you're going to have that crop under there that the sunlight's not hitting. It's going to be slower to drive down. So looking at the uh, relative driving rate of leaves and stems, as we can see, the leaves are going to dry down a lot faster than the stems. So we need to try to bring those together as much as we can. The way we can do that is by conditioning, getting those stems drying down and dry, get them to dry down just as fast as the leaves do. Uh, by that, we're going to have better retention of the leaves. Uh, and as we know, that's where a lot of our quality is coming from, is from the leaves of the plant. So conditioning must crimp the steel to stem to allow moisture to escape. Leaves should remain undisturbed to minimize bruising and increase leaf retention. Uh, what I'm thinking about when, when we're talking about this is we just want to crimp that stem. We just want to crimp it, give it an opening, give it a spot for moisture to release. We don't want to smash the whole plant. We don't want to bruise the leaves. We're trying to keep all that intact and in the best shape it can while also trying to get it to dry down as fast as we possibly can. Leaves contain highest nutrients, so like we said, we want to retain those. High contact of rows flattens the entire plant, including the leaves, resulting in damage and loss of leaves that dry up before the stem. Like I talked about, we just want to crimp, we just want to break that stem, give it an opening for that moisture to come out. We don't want to smash the whole stem. We don't want to bruise the leaves. Uh, we want to help this crop along as much as we can with the late, least amount of damage. Looking at steel conditioning rollers, that gives us just that point of contact to just break that stem, open it up, and, and leave that moisture. What we're looking for is every two inches. Every two inches breaking that stem, giving it as much a, a place as we can for that moisture to release because that water is, is fairly tightly held in that crop at that point to when we need to try to get it out. Um, we also offer with some of our products a, a double conditioner roller. Um, you're offering to crimp every one to one and a half inches just giving more places to release that moisture out of the stem. So we're also looking at hydraulic roll tension. Uh, what hydraulics is going to do for you, it's going to keep a standard all the way across, no matter what, no matter the thickness of your crop mat. Uh, you don't have springs to become weakened and not give you the pressure. Uh, an accumulator on those hydraulics 
is a very important thing to look for. That way if any obstructions come into that piece of equipment, those rollers can expand and let that obstruction through. So minimizing ash content. Ash content is, is going to be foreign debris in that hay. That foreign debris is going to greatly reduce your quality. Uh, ash and forage comes from two sources. Internal, which is already there in the crop, it has it. Minerals like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus. External, dirt, bedding, sand. Uh, the average internal ash content of alfalfa is about 8% and the grass is about 6%. Uh, so ash provides mineral to the diet, but does not provide calories. Uh, so it takes a place of nutrients on almost a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, ash content above that contained in plant is dirt. So anything above that 8% in that alfalfa is dirt that has been picked up during raking, cutting, or baling of that crop. So avoid harvesting a large crop. Uh, I understand it happens uh, weather, uh, maturity. Uh, but trying to select varieties that do stand better, uh, trying to get in on, on your harvesting time, get in before a big weather event, uh, get in at a less mature stage to try to prevent that. Uh, raising the height of your cutter bar on your disc vines, uh, especially in dry conditions, the, the more dirt that you're going to pull in, the more ash content you're going to have. Uh, as you cut closer to the ground, you've got more of a chance of kicking up dirt just from the the airflow of that machine and bringing it into your hay crop. So getting it up off the ground. Um, also, if you, if you notice a lot of ash content, you can try a flat blade to not get that uplift. If you're still getting get, if you can do that and still get a nice clean cut, you know, not get in there when the crop is lodged, that can help out a lot, especially in dry weather by not bringing in all that dirt. Uh, so keeping the windrow off the ground, like we said, Widen that windrow out, make it lighter, make it sit up on top of that stubble and not get drove down into the dirt that keeps the dirt from off the bottom of that windrow. Uh, like we said, starting with a wide swath and placing crop on the stubble. Uh, keep rake times from touching the ground. Um, as If you've noticed a lot of ash content as you progress into the future, if you do have ground driven rakes, uh, it might be a good idea to look at hydraulic or PTO powered rakes that way you do have the option of getting those rake teeth up off the ground, which is going to be better for the equipment, but is also going to keep from bringing in all that foreign material as you rake up that windrow. So we'll look at raking and baling and what we can do there to increase our quality. Uh, maximize leaf retention, rake when forage is above 40% moisture content. Uh, so trying to get out there and rake when that crop is tough, uh, when that leaf does want to stay on. Uh, rakes so tines do not touch the ground like we talked about. Uh, move forage minimal horizontal distance. Uh, as you can see here, dry matter loss and leaf loss go right along together. Uh, as, as we lose more leaf, the dry matter loss is going right with it. So the quality is going to greatly decrease if you're not retaining those leaves in that crop. So looking at some benefits of, a, of certain balers with producing a quality uh, product, uh, maximizing leaf retention, wide low profile pickup for minimum crop disturbance. Uh, try to always select a wide pickup on whatever type of baler you have. Uh, by doing that, you're bringing in that whole windrow. You're not having to roll that windrow over. You're not having to move that crop any more than you have to. So having that wider pickup just allows you to bring that windrower in, not be stuffing it all together, not be damaging that crop further because uh, you're at the driest point. Uh, inline designs do eliminate direction changes. So like we said, the less you have to handle that crop and move it in another direction, the less damage you're going to have. Uh, uptime and reliability. Um, selecting equipment that you know you can keep up and running. Just like we said, a, a delay of a day getting out there and getting that crop built up can, re can reduce a lot of your yield just by the damage you're going to cause that up and coming crop that's still in the field. Um, capacity, more tons per hour, more tons per hour, you're putting up a crop faster, you're getting in there and getting off that field and letting it recover. Uh, density, just less bales, so less time, less money spent bringing that crop in off the field. Uh, and those are some sources for this, but uh, you know, just the things I was thinking about as I was going through this uh, is just 
like I said in the beginning, trying to size your equipment for your operation. If your operation grows and you double your acreages, it might be time to look at uh, upgrading to a larger disc bind, um, maybe not even going to a larger disc bind, maybe going to a center pivot, just something that allows you to get in there, get that crop on the ground, uh, making sure we can get it to 60% before nightfall and doing the best we can to get it to 40% and stop that respiration. Uh, the other thing I thought was good um, going through this and thing to keep an eye, kind of keep your mind on uh, is, is definitely raking. Uh, looking at other options, there, there is a lot of dirt and foreign material that gets brought in by ground-driven rakes. Uh, so looking at other options that might fit your, your production a little better, uh, give you that lower ash content and give you a, a higher, more uh, quality product. Uh, but those are just a few of the, the points that I took away from this. Uh, just something to keep your mind on as you progress um, through this year, through the next few years, uh, when you are going to upgrade your equipment. Um, not so much just upgrading for the quality of equipment, upgrade your equipment to where you can increase the quality of the product that you're putting up with it. So, Again, thank you. Uh, Wayne Supply has multiple locations across the state of Kentucky. Stop in any of them anytime. We love to talk about our products with you. So thank you all very much. Yes, sir. Yes, that. Well, no, no. By doing that, you're also breaking up that waxy cuticle that's on the outside of that plant, um, and that is going to help release moisture. So that would be like uh, you see a disbind with a flail conditioner. That's going to be what that does. That's going to be rubbing that waxy coating off, and that does help that plant break down also. So other than just a crimper, that flail conditioner is an option. Um, I talked to some producers, and, and some will go with the flail conditioner if they're um, harvesting things like sorghum sudan, uh, something that's a big crop that you might worry about having trouble getting that much mass through the condition rollers. So that is a, a good option. It's a good option. Yes, the flail conditioner is going to be a little harder on the crop just because of the nature of, of what you have going on there. Um, it, it can be a lot harder. Uh, it can be a lot harder on alfalfa crop because it's just a lot better chance of beating the leaves off of that alfalfa. Um, and it is tough on, on things like clover and things too. Any other questions? Um, what I would suggest, what he asked was, is there a way to try to reduce that impact if you do have a flail conditioner? Uh, making sure, trying to do your best to make sure it's set correctly. Uh, with those flails, as that drone comes around, you want to have those flails straight out. You don't want to have them so tight that they're bent back uh, or so loose, so loose that you're not breaking that waxy coating off. So trying to have that flail conditioner, doing your best you can to try to judge the, the mat of crop you're going to have coming through and getting that adjusted correctly, that's going to help out a whole lot. Um, as those flails bend back, the way I understand that's going to it drastically increases the chance of, of uh, damaging the crop. Give us a, are you a fan of metal conditioning rollers or uh, rubber conditioning rollers? We, I, I've, I've talked to a lot of guys, a lot of the producers I see are leaning towards a, a steel on steel conditioner roll or a rubber on steel conditioner roll. Um, I, I'm kind of behind the belief the pattern makes a little more difference than the material. Um, with the steel on steel is going to hold up a little better uh, than the rubber. We've all seen, uh, heard of things of those delaminating. But just getting that action to where that stem, you're just getting a break in that stem. You're not mashing it and you're not mashing the whole crop. So um, I, I'm, I'm bigger kind of on the design of that conditioner roller just to get that break in the stem. 